All right, I think I'll make a start. So as we begin this session, I want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I am broadcasting from today. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and also to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Martin Reyes. I'm the Project and Communications Officer at Writing New South Wales, but I'm also a writer myself. Um, I wanted to thank Bankside Arts Centre for curating and presenting this session. Today, I'm joined by three Western Sydney-based writers who were selected for the Incubate Artist Residencies, a joint initiative between Bankside Arts Centre and Sydney Review of Books. They each wrote incredible essays responding broadly to the themes of care, isolation, stewardship, and custodianship. Annie Brockenhus Shack is an emerging curator, producer, and writer based in Western Sydney. She holds a master's in curating and cultural leadership. She currently works for Sydney Theatre Company and Contemporary Asian Australian Performance. She is the co-founder of theatre production company Collective and is currently developing a new theatrical work, Salt Baby, with Pact and Kusula Powerhouse Art Centre. We also have Helen Tran, a Vietnamese Australian writer working on Gadigal land. Her work can be found on SBS Voices, Pearl Magazine, Sydney Review of Books, Baby Teeth Journal, and more. Finally, we are joined by James Go, who writes from Darug Land and according to his Twitter bio, thinks about racial capitalism and colonial presence. One by one, I'll get each of them to read a brief paragraph or excerpt from their essays, and then I'll follow up with a question. So Helen, did you wanna go first? Sure, let me just get it up. Um... Okay, so I'm going to read the first couple of paragraphs from my essay, which is called Scraps, which was released, I'm going to say about two weeks ago. It was my father's 67th birthday. What had brought us here? Here refers not to one locality, but to a moment streamed across seas and through internet connections. The term Zoom party rang in my ears as I started the meeting. Faces of uncles I hadn't seen in seven years popped up. I saw my elder brothers each with a beer in hand and my father sitting in front of the altar in our family home. Off screen, boisterous discussions about what constituted the best piece of sashimi occupied my mother and sisters. Everyone, a drink in hand as if to say, I am pausing the world right now. To say, it doesn't matter we cannot leave our homes. We have this and I feel it as you do the frosted glass against the inside of my palm. We are holding hands and clinking glasses. The call lasted six hours. My father dipped in and out of the room, took cigarette breaks between pouring bourbon and Cokes and laughing with the gallery when another person's camera froze on an unfortunate facial expression. I felt guilty for being 17 kilometers away from my family, away from Kenny Heights, away from the home that I had moved out of the year before. I wondered if my mother and father felt something similar only instead they had thousands of kilometers to simmer on and 35 years of distance from their siblings and their parents' graves and their siblings' children and so on. My sister Elle was off screen the entire time. And though I knew she was sitting on the couch, I noted the absence for how it did not feel like a happenstance, but an opened wound. It is a difficult thing to have gotten used to not seeing her, but the sharp pangs have dull. I guess it was as is so often called these days, the new normal. Thank you. Nope, you're on mute. Thanks for that. Thanks for the heads up. Um, your essay, Scraps, was um, beautiful. I thought it was really sophisticated and poetic, as is all your writing. You managed to write about COVID, although you, you know, your circumstances in the pandemic in a really refreshing way. I'm sure we're all kind of tired about hearing about it. Um, so it's a really hard thing to do, and you did it really well. But I wanted to know, how did you handle these themes of care or isolation broadly in your work? Yeah, when I saw the call out for uh, the residency, I immediately, instead of kind of, especially the term custodianship is, uh, and care, they're not exactly the words I knew, of course, and but not exactly words I had really considered as uh, things I think about very deeply. And, but for me, realizing how, 
um, apt it was to have this residency because those words, especially looking at the word care, really had been something I am motivated by um, for a lot of things. And specifically as this essay is about uh, a lot about my family, um, realizing how much of that is just so deeply involved and um, this emotion of care perhaps is even more, is even stronger than any of the, I don't know, love or fear and things like that, because it encapsulates it all. And so when I wrote this essay, it was, um, for those who haven't read the essay, it goes through quite a few changes and it ends in a different place uh, from where, where it began. And that was due to circumstances changing. And it was a huge surprise to me as well that the, the way it ended up um, reading by the end of it. Um, and so, and that in itself was an act of kind of trying to understand the way it's care is such a ever evolving emotion and the way it uh, impacts on our actions and the way you interact with people. And even myself, like for myself interacting with writing and in that henceforth the circle of my own feelings and things like that. So I try to take it or at a very slow pace, even though it felt um, like being bombarded and being smacked in the face. <laughs> but what I've discovered is that the in in particular in writing the essay and our um, all of us working within these mediums that to perhaps are therapeutic for us at certain points. I know for me it certainly is. It's a matter of taking it as it comes, basically. Great, thank you so much. Right. Honey, um, let's hear from you. Hey, um, I wanna say that I am tuning in from Darug country and acknowledge um, the traditional custodians um, uh, and the el elders um, past and present. Um, so my uh, essay is called Kapwa, a three card spread um, and so yeah, I'll just read the beginning um, couple of paragraphs. Mum has been gardening, a hobby since her teaching days in Atimonan. She stops by, yeah, she stops at my window, peering up from beneath the wide brim of Dad's Akubra hat to ask if I can help her log on to a Zoom meeting with her fellow sisters from Handmaids of the Lord. She spots a tarot deck on my bed. Abba, what is that? Cards, I neko. You don't depend on them. Don't forget to pray. Do you pray? This is the extent of my conversations with my mom concerning tarot. My mom shirks any suggestions that she is superstitious. She has faith in God. So what is the point of indulging unknown fears? She goes on about how I had a good Catholic upbringing, church every weekend, regular prayer meetings and attending a Catholic high school, at least until year 10 when I transferred to a performing arts high school. It's a Saturday afternoon in this iteration, iteration of lockdown. I'm at home at my parents' place in Campbelltown and I'm shuff, shuffling cards. I spend time each year looking through old journal entries, which lead me to realize how much stays the same. Negative self-talk and overall frustration with navigating the world. The narratives and experiences that have framed my sense of growing up, sense of self growing up the way I'd treated myself when I started becoming chronically sick and unproductive. These left me looking elsewhere to rewire thought patterns. Tarot is a tool that I have been using on a daily basis for a few years now. Each card drawn is a bridge to universal archetypes and begins an intuitive conversation between the universe and myself. These are gentle reminders that I am connected to ancestors and guides. To me, tarot isn't necessarily predicting futures. Rather, to draw cards is to perform acts of care, acts that help that let me explore forms of nourishment. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, as a fellow Filipino writer from Campbelltown as well, um, I, I've been thinking a lot about the notion of kapwa. Uh, for a really long time. And I've always wanted to write something about it. So when I saw your essay, um, I was really pleased. Um, and for those of you who 
um, haven't read the essay or don't know what kapwa is, it's a Tagalog word which uh, can't be directly translated into English. It means like shared self or shared identity, self and other um, together with a person. Um, so, Annie, can you tell us a bit more about the act of using tarot cards and how it ties into this notion of kapwa for you? Um, I, so kapwa for me is essentially that everything ends up being interconnected, whether that is other people or whether that is also non-human um, forms um, of life as well. So um, it sort of made sense to me that um, tarot would be a tool to sort of um, be a medium to sort of express or like find a way to connect with other forms of um, non-human life um, for want of a better esoteric phrase. Um, yeah, and so I guess that was sort of where I was trying to come from um, with it. And I think, but also like, I sort of thought as well um, at the beginning of writing this essay that Kapwa is also showing up as your full self um, and like tarot and um, spirituality have sort of been on my mind and so have like Kapwa and the whole sort of um, psychology and Filipino, which is Filipino psychology. Um, yeah, and all of these sort of concepts have been at the forefront and I'm just like, they all make up who I am in some way, shape or form. So in some some way, I just wanted to like smush everything together and just be like, here, this is me. <laughs> um, yeah, that's my approach to how I attempted to do that. So right. whether or not it worked is a different <laughs> story. It works, it worked beautifully. Um, uh, James, did you wanna read something from your essay? Um, sure. Yeah, I also just want to say uh, I am um, zooming in from Dara country and acknowledge that this is unceded land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I'm just going to read an extract that takes place in the middle of the piece, Severance. Okay. When his train put up in Bankstown at 4.30, he had to make he had to sprint to make the bus. Downtrodden and tired, passengers all around him streamed out of the trains and up the stairs like schools of fish. Excuse, excuse, excuse. The crowd at the bottom of the stairs hardly budged, but still the boy twisted into the gaps he could see, insisting that he could carve out the space he needed. Hijabs, round brim hats, metallic shopping carts. Left and right, everyone marched up the stairs, looked down at the steps as their bags pulled their shoulders to the ground. Step, step, step. He wanted to break away from the bodies like blood from a wound. When he reached the top of the stairs, however, he found himself amongst the people he thought he had left behind. In the crowd, the boy would be one of many Arab and Asian bodies who arrived. Together, but by no means commensurate, they, the mass, are the memento mori of Lebanese and Vietnamese collective life. They are what Jody A. Bird, citing Kamal Brathwaite, terms arrivance. They are fragments of a social wholeness, which has been subjugated by French colonialism, upended by American interventionism in civil war, and reforged as migrant labor on unceded land in a former outpost of British empire. At the ticket barriers, the people would come face to face with the police, imperial debris against the glare of settler colonial authority. The two police officers, like the boy, were regulars at this train station. The man had blue eyes, the woman, the woman dark brown hair tied into a low bun, and pink flushed both their pale cheeks. The man would hold onto his belt with one hand and talk with the other. Listening, the woman would, the woman would rest her hand on the walkie-talkie that protruded from her right pocket and chuckle in her polite, controlled way. Although they were chatting away next to the ticket machine, everyone in the station knew that the patrols could turn towards the ticket barriers at any moment. The boy had a lot of questions he wanted to ask, but he knew better than that. Everyone who grew up here knew that the last thing he wanted to do was to get involved with the police. Still, the boy wanted to ask whether it was satisfying to look for something where there was nothing. Slowly but surely, the arrivants shuffled into the ticket barriers. They were all tired tired from working to live, to pay off an historical debt they had inherited through their bodies. Displaced and unfree, they plodded on beyond the enclosures in the long shadow of the human. To pass through checkpoints overseen by police then, 
was to have their bodies opened up, hailed and incorporated for profit and for governance. A flood of arriving bodies indiscriminately funneled into the ticket barriers, yet individuated by red teeth snapping. Pay up, pay up, they say. Economies of dispossession, the boy would later learn from Jody A. Bird, Alyosha Goldstein, Jody Malamud, and Chandan Reddy, are at once epistemologies of commensurability and differential devaluation. When he walked up to offer his student pass to the tongue of the gates, he knew his uniform, a wool blazer, a sky blue or white dress shirt, a chocolate or maroon silk tie, gray shorts, knee high socks and black leather shoes, coupled with his straight black hair, made him less deviant, if not socially respectable even, and thus unremarkable to the cops. And so every time he passed through the ticket barriers, he felt his mobility wetting the rocks upon which others slipped. Thank you so much, James. Um, I was really able to connect with your essay, Severance. I mean, I didn't go to a selective high school or um, I, you know, I didn't make those daily commutes from the inner city to the Western suburbs on a, uh, during high school, but I definitely know people who did. Um, I was on your Twitter again, obviously my homework by looking at Twitter. Um, and you said this essay attempts to capture what you see as disturbed Arab-Asian uh, relationalities under racial capitalism. Um, did you want to elaborate on how you're able to communicate that? And you definitely communicated it just in, th in that reading that you did, but how you were able to communicate that through the act of commuting or that commute? Yeah, sure. Um, so for me, I think uh, when I came to write this piece, I was really, um, I guess, I was really trying to respond to the theme of isolation. And I thought about that, uh, I thought about, I guess, how isolation often goes hand in hand with, um, with interdependence. And so when, when I thought about, so I decided to focus on my commute from, um, from school to home, city to suburb, because I thought about how it was often at these different transport hubs, the train, the bus, the train station, the bus stop, where I could see people from different walks of life, people on with different uh, going along different trajectories, and who have who are placed with different life chances, coming together as well as splitting off. Right, people go to train stations or to or transport hubs just to split off once again. And I kind of wanted to explore that kind of I guess uh, I kind of wanted to explore how in the space of Bankstown in particular, which is where I grew up and I still reside. I wanted to think about how there were some there were Arab and Asian bodies who guess, who share a common history, both at a communal at a community level and a structural level. How they're in such close proximity yet feel such distance, um, I guess, between and with each other. And for me, I really um, I wanted to get to. I looked. I used commuting as a way to look at how. There were divisions that took that manifested in both structure, a structural level, historical level, spatial level. Um, in the for, uh, when thinking about the ticket barriers, for example, as well as at the interpersonal level. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much why I decided to use commuting because I thought it captured. Uh, it, it was a way. It commuting itself, I guess, was I guess a lightning rod for thinking about space, mobility, and different levels of difference. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I think uh, using commuting was definitely a powerful way um, to do all that stuff. Um, just to the audience, if you want to ask um, Annie, Helen, or James any questions, feel free to pop it into the chat. Uh, we'll do a and a later on. Um, now, considering you were all writing these essays during lockdown and you were isolated from family and friends, I'm assuming you had a lot of time to kind of reflect particularly on the, on the essay's themes of that you were tasked to, to write, um, you know, that feeling of isolation and, uh, you know, acts of care for yourself and others. I'm wondering, did that change or inform the way that you wrote your pieces? And am I right in um, thinking that you were actually, uh, uh, you were accepted into the residency before the second breakout? So, yeah, it would have been really timely. So feel free to all three of you to jump in. Yeah, sure, I can jump in. Um, so yes, we were definitely, it was really 
fantastic in the sense that we at least managed to meet each other all once before the uh, lockdown happened by going to the Bankstown Art Centre and seeing the space where we were going to write, which was the little, the Incubate studio. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to do that. And I think one thing that really shifted when starting the residency, you know, thinking we were going to be in person on, la on the land of Bankstown and that area, um, but then making it um, digital was that there was a lot of focus we wanted uh, the residency wanted a lot of focus on the history of the land we're on and to really ground ourselves in the spaces we're in. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, when, for me, when it shifted to a digital one, I panicked a little bit because I was like, well, how am I going to write about this <laughs> space if I'm not physically there? But I think with all of us, um, where there's an element of the personal and the self within each of our essays, it was genuinely genuinely a, a, a great exercise for me to remember that I've lived <laughs> in my entire life and going back into the memories and pinpointing these little kind of pockets of time mm. that are like within the home within your the way you speak with your family or your friends or yourself that are still so representative of these um, the space that you grew up in, in the um, in the suburbs and things like that. Um, and yeah, it kind of helped me reframe memories I had that I hadn't thought about before. So in the essay, I write about a university assignment I did years ago where I, uh, where I did a sh like a four minute documentary on how my parents met. Um, my parents met in a detention camp in Vietnam and I had super I found like royalty free videos and images of like building rubble and like and had put like a sad piano piece song on top and um added black and white filters and all these things and um like I got a HD I was like yep yeah, got and got these white people um sobbing in their chairs but <laughs> when I look back at it now I I'm quite just uh, I just irked out by my own actions because it was in itself some a sort of um pandering to a different lens which reminds me of a line that, that in your essay Annie that really um I really enjoyed which was um that terms such as diversity are considered white concepts and maintain hegemonic structures because they make sense of difference through a white lens I thought that was such a fantastic line and I it made me think of not only about diversity but just also how um yourself as a person himself as a creator of color has to like so actively combat against that lens as well because it's your way of it's your way of knowing that you can create a space for yourself but it's a space that's been delineated so I don't know um by academics and um other creators before you that aren't necessarily looking at the best interests or the um to make that space holistic holistic enough for you to fully express yourselves without these kind of combating elements of what kind of stories one should tell um and so yeah a lot of for me mm, grambling a lot of the um being in the home um not with my parents uh, I had to move homes rapidly within the lockdown all of it kind of was a disruption of like the space I thought I would have to do it and like feeling connected physically um and understanding that to the ability to harness the power of care and like within isolation the ability to take what you have and fill out these kind of nostalgic memories or the future cl present close future with um the power of I'm not to say care I'm losing my train of thought but yeah that was me <laughs> <laughs> thanks um James or Annie any 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 thoughts yeah um, I'll jump in here um certainly I think that we had a lot of different expectations prior to beginning our residencies as well as once we were um within the sort of thick of it um I think a lot of credit should be um I guess a good a shout out to Katrina Menzies Pike at the SRB as well as Vandana Ram at Bankstown Art Centre. They provided us with a lot of support. We were always um, talking about our pieces, able to contact them where necessary. 
um, because there were certainly times for me when, I mean, I think for me, I guess, like um, I have grown up with Bang Sun for all these years. And so I guess having planned to write about the spaces of the train station, the bus stop, suddenly being, I guess, almost divorced from them, and not being able to access those spaces during time was kind of quite ironic. Uh, but I did find that it led me, to, um, similar to Helen, to kind of dig to basically trawl through a lot of uh, memories. Oftentimes when I was writing, writing the pieces, I found myself kind of uh, doing a kind of archaeological dig of my past and the ways in which I understood the space as well as my and uh, what were the things that mediated my relations with family, with friends? Um, what were those things? What were those things that mediated um, them through my experience of space, through home, through belonging? And um, because a lot of at the beginning, there was um, definitely had, I had a thoughts about, you know, looking through archival material about Bankstown, but obviously the library was closed. And um, that meant that, I guess, you know, to switch from a sort of more, I guess, the more authoritative empirical archive was to go through a sort of personal archive of memories and a lot of sort of Google map searching, street view, walking, looking around, looking at timetables. Um, and, and to speak to your question about care, it, I also often uh, spoke to other um, friends who also took the, who went along a similar commute with me um, to, I guess, check again, check my own writing against memory. Mm -hmm. um, but furthermore, I think that there were, um, beyond the act of thinking through memory, it was also to realize that the circumstances of the pandemic, in particular, you know, increased policing within the Canary Bankstown area in particular, also, I guess, brought extra, uh, almost Im impetus to my own writing when thinking about those encounters at the ticket barriers to think about how things that I've become acculturated to are simply repeating or being innovated in different forms in the pandemic with the, you know, with the sort of hardening of new administrative categories, like the local government area, as opposed to a sort of racial category. Um, yeah, and so I guess in short, really, the pandemic definitely made me work from memory and that memory opened itself up to a lot of different ways. And of course, um, wonderful Katrina and Vandana really, really helped to kind of just remind us that, I'm sure I know for myself, Helen, I'm sure Annie as well, um, that uh, the opportunity also uh, opened up different, I guess, um, different, um, different ideas really and different approaches yeah yeah I think all um I was saying earlier how all all three of your essays are very distinct and different and uh play around with form and I I guess like I guess the lockdown probably um uh, informed that um Annie did did that does that resonate with you at all yeah um I yeah the form in particular I was because I have never written an essay with tarot cards in it um <laughs> so I'm just in my mind I was like so what's a precedent for how to write <laughs> um with tarot cards um and how do I not make it but also sort of ground it in a way that feels relatable and not sort of like pop psychology sort of trying to yeah and too optimistic I guess um so I think being able to um like my this essay is sort of based on um my master's research um which I did last year um which was also like on Kapwa, but in regards to curatorial care um, and how that sort of explored and um, how we can sort of potentially use Kapwa in regards to, um, yeah, more, more collaborative work. Um, and I think with this one, it's like having to, writing this in lockdown sort of made it made it more apparent that it was gonna be a more personal piece um, and it would have to like dig through the layers and become a bit more vulnerable. Mm. Um, 
which was interesting, um, also really tiring um, during lockdown as well of like how much emotional stuff do I want to like push through? I'm already tired. Can I just rest? <laughs> um, but it's, I think, yeah, it sort of shows itself in the work. Um, and um, yeah, I think, so I sort of ended up questioning why Kapwa was important within this sort of time frame and within now and what it sort of can speak to within like this sort of current lockdown period um, and sort of why am I writing about this I guess and what is the what would I want the audience to sort of get out of reading um, my essay and it's sort of like yeah I was I was curious in um, in wanting to hear or sort of like my my thoughts around this were around that the yeah that everything is connected and because there was so much more division this time around that this particular lockdown felt a lot harder um, for everyone and felt noticeably more divisive as well um, and it's I'm not saying that couple is the answer, but it's just a nice thing to have to mm -hmm. sort of reflect on as something that can be, um, yeah, just something to reflect on in regards to of how we sort of interact with one another. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, particularly when everything is so divisive and um, hyped up at the moment. So, yeah. And in your essay, um... For those of you who haven't read it, so you are drawing out the tarot cards as the essay unfolds, which I thought was yeah. uh, a really fascinating way to, uh, to write about it. Um, can you talk a bit more about specifically the Kapwa tarot cards and how drawing that out allows you to care for yourself or that's an act of care for you and yeah. the other people around you? Um so tarot in general it has always been um a tool for me in regards to sort of pausing before i go about my day and recognizing how um i guess for want of a better word or phrase it's like affirmations but you're allowing you're taking the moment to to rewire or to think about how you want to talk to yourself that day um and so um or how you want to move through the world or how you want to engage with um people um and so um Kapwa Tarot um is a deck um by a Filipino American artist um and it like it's full of like decolonial imagery and sort of um, Filipinx um, mythology as well, um, which I've been starting to like deep a little um, dig a little deeper into, which has been really cool. Um, and sort of like it's sort of pulling the cards for me has recognized has made me recognize like the more I learn about things, the more I don't know about things. Um, and um, having to be open to other possibilities that might um, come across and um, being able to sort of recognize and listen to perspectives um, that may come through in very like soft moments that like um, through guides or whatnot or through interactions or um, yeah, it's just been, it's been interesting. And then also then like sharing it with, um, in my own creative practice as well and noticing how people sort of respond to that and how it's like, it slowly starts to change people's perspectives of how they want to approach the space, how they want to interact within the space, how they hold themselves as well. And I think that's really, 
and recognizing that like, huh, we're all sharing a moment together and um, we're all connected in this moment together. Um, and that feels quite nourishing and we don't have to push ourselves because of capitalism. <laughs> um, we don't have to like be overtly productive um, even though that's sort of like what we're sort of ingrained to do, particularly as like um, cowed creators. Um, and, but then like we end up burning out. So how is that sustainable for anyone? Um, yeah, so I think that, yeah, that's sort of where I'm at with it anyway. Yeah. Thanks. Um, going to James, um, in the last paragraph of your essay, you wrote, I cannot help but find myself constantly confronted by my own social mobility. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of second generation children of migrants, particularly from Western Sydney, face. Um, like we might be university educated where our parents might not have been, um, et cetera. Um, can you speak more about that? Like the specifically being confronted uh, with the social mobility? Sure. So, um, it's been confronted. Um, I think, I suppose that for me, it was, um, for me, it's the, it's the awareness that on these every single day, right? Um, as I travel from the city to the suburbs, you meet different people at different, um, uh, different parts of the commute. So on the train, there are different people who board at different train stations. I write about how it's quite clear who are the people on the train who apparently who look like they have important places to be versus uh, people, um, you know, you can tell this by the, what, they're, what they're carrying, the sort of baggage that they wear. Is it a laptop bag, a sort of messenger bag, or is it, or is it a grocery? Is it, re is it a really cumbersome kind of, is, is it really cumbersome uh, shopping bags? Or do people have school bags? And for me, thinking about social mobility was also to think about the way that the city of Sydney, uh, that Sydney metropolitan area is divided itself. And to think about how my own movement towards the city from Bankstown was very much, I was very aware that, this, that I was taking part in a sort of brain drain. And the end, my essay was an attempt to think through what are the, what happens when you return, when you return and go and go uh, return against the sort of current of the brain drain. And to think about how once I'm off the train, once I'm off the train and onto the bus, which um, I guess, as most people know, the bus networks are much more localized. Uh, much more localized within a particular region to think about who I was sitting alongside with. And at the end of, I mean, the last section of my essay, I detail my bus ride. And there's a lot of deliberate paralleling between the train ride and bus ride, interacting with other boys in the bus, first of all, who are peers, school classmates, versus people who would be, I guess, neighbors. And the sort of confrontations with my social mobility were to see how different people were being read on the bus how um, in particular students from local high schools were being read, seen very, very differently to myself. But for me to think about how, um, I guess I had, you know, I was very, I'm, I'm very aware that like life has taken me on, on a kind of different path and yet I'm still of the same place. I think that uh, I talk about how um, I don't know them, but I think that they like me have parents who are just constantly working that's why we're on the bus we don't have people to drive us home from the train station when we want to we, they, we might not have, all have cars to get us where we want to in private transport and so thinking about how public transport in this case the bus was really a place that stages that staged these encounters where i was confronted by my own kind of um, estrangement from experiences that these kids had growing up having their friends in a local area whereas my friends we would because we all came from different parts of sydney would have to hang out in the city and for me it was thinking about you know what is that distance that's created by those experiences by by the fact that I have kind of been swept up in a kind of brain drain and yet don't actually like that brain drain might uh, might fall along the lines of cultural capital or um, all my education but that's not reflected in through my I guess my material means mm. and um, for me it was seeing how those kids also represented uh, possible they, could, they were also possible futures that I could have gone down had life taken had life just been a little bit different yeah. and I really wanted to I didn't want to think that this was that this meant that there was going to be insurmountable distance forever but I wanted to kind of use the piece to explore what are, what does this what does this proximity also enable at the same time 
yeah and um i hope that answers the question about uh, presentation um, thank you um helen i just wanted to go into craft um so in your essay you were kind of able to take yourself in and out of it and address yourself and you were taking the readers through your original essay plan like incorporating the process of actually writing what the audience would be reading which i found very fascinating i thought it was really complex and well done what drew you to um that stylistic choice or that form um yes yeah, so it kind of it wasn't, it definitely wasn't how I had planned to write the essay. Um, I did have kind of a different uh, structures that I was going for. And as in the essay, I say that, I say it's very specifically, I had 11 points that I was going to write. I was going to hit every single one. Each one was going to be this many words. Um, but then basically what happened, I guess I'll spoil a bit of the essay. It's... <laughs> Um, basically when in the essay I write that family members in Vietnam got COVID and very shocking news and it was very upsetting and not being able to go home and see my mum or you know last year I was meant to go to Vietnam up for the first time in I'm going to say seven years but I wasn't able to and so it kind of felt like the only way that I could push myself out of this like uh, brain fog I was in regarding the essay because it then it, it all then felt kind of cheap to me in a way to just write it as I had before um, in a way that was describing these kind of past moments and I think I say a line in there like I liked I like the idea of writing an essay about grievances in the past that's all tied up now and everyone's a better person and it's a uh, but with this essay it just wasn't possible at all because we're still living with um, the pandemic and, and some people will forever because they've had family members and loved ones pass away and it's very it's just quite tragic um that inspiration did come from catching enough uh with the essay because I had expressed this just not knowing what to do and and then she had said a lot something to me like but what you're feeling right now this uh, brain fog and kind of not feeling like you're able to keep writing it is also part of the writing process as well and so mm. I was like let's so we popped it in there and it really genuinely helped me kind of uh, look at it all from an incredibly different angle and it kind of zoomed me out as well as like not just me writing about the the content of the essay which was to look at uh specifically about oh i'm gonna cough give me one second <coughs> apologies um bless you i was gonna write about uh my sister who had had a lot of health concerns and you know just talk about the ways uh our own self-care or care of our own bodies is dif differentiates and how growing up in a uh, very collectivistic family unit changes and affects those types of cares but then it kind of zoomed out more and became a little bit meta in terms of it was me looking at me writing this essay about this situation while this situation was being developed in real time by various other factors that were completely outside of my control and it was it was almost like morbidly serendipitous <laughs> that the way the essay kind of all came together because things I had been thinking about in June um, by the time it came to September um, were relevant in completely different ways mm -hmm. and so being within those emotions was very very taxing um, but being able to look at myself writing as someone who's uh, working with those emotions to was therapeutic and really cathartic in a way. Um, and also I genuinely think made me a better uh, writer in terms of analyzing what, how I'm uh, interacting with my own actions, um, which um, not, I don't think I had really done as much before. So it was really great in that respect too, in terms of honing the craft, like it, it really felt like a, yeah, it kind of felt like a bird's eye view at the same time while also lying on the ground. It was very bizarre. 
Yeah. Um, just on form again, um, we have a question from Sheila who asks, um, I want to know more about how you all wrestled with form, especially as you all took very different approaches. Did you choose the form of your essays early on or did you find the content of what you wanted to say dictated from the form your pieces ultimately took? Well, yeah, I guess for me, I answered the question. It was all thrown out the window. <laughs> to Annie, Annie and James. I started off being like, yeah, I'm going to be like, it's going to be like this, this and this. And then like, as I started to write it, I'm just like, I don't know anymore. And then I'm just like, it, um, bless Katriona for like having to deal with like me just emailing be like, I don't know if it's like the form before the content or the content before the form. And I and so it like that was I was constantly spiraling between um that for like a good couple of weeks before um I sort of like attempted to feel my way through stuff um a little bit um yeah and I think it eventually it eventually got to the only thing that I knew that I wanted to do was use the cards in the thing but I didn't know how I wanted to use the cards in the thing um and I didn't know why I was like I, I specifically why um I wanted to use them I just knew that they were gonna like appear somehow um and so I yeah it was just a lot of like writing um content and hoping that something would come up um yeah like that's that, just writing in general <laughs> everyone's practice yeah so that was me James um, did you have anything to add yeah um this was I uh, to answer Sheila's question like god no the, you, the, like it didn't end up how I thought it would be and I didn't know how to in me to write something like this whatever's on the page um I'm not a creative I guess for me, I've always, um, in my own academic writing, I've always been someone who, whose content decides the form. Um, I've always found that uh, having, I guess, form, formal prescriptions tends to limit for limits or foreclose possibilities. It often means that you're, um, or I have something that content is, exceeds that kind of form because it resists reduction to particular boundaries, um, genre, for, genre, form, ideology, etc. Um, so for me, the way I came to writing a piece that was ultimately kind of a creative autofiction piece that was in a third person uh, for, for the most part, as opposed to what I had thought, which was going to be a, a braided essay, which was going to have uh, some personal reflections, third person academic writing and theorizing or commenting on particular objects. I found myself experimenting with different styles, trying to write the piece in a first person kind of memoir kind of format only to realize that I was getting stuck with moving my my boy, my persona around a lot. Um, I'm not a creative, writer, a creative writer by training whatsoever. And it was really, really difficult for me. And so I experimented with different styles and was quite inspired by two books I'd read actually. Uh, one of which is uh, Professor Hazel Carby's Imperial Intimacies, Tale of Two Islands and Sadia Hartman's uh, Wayward Lives. Both of those texts are texts that try to write alternate histories or to recuperate, I guess, forgotten voices and people in history. So in Hazel Carby's uh, piece, she's using a girl um, for her, as a figure, a double for herself, um, writing about her own um, experience growing up in London as a mixed race Jamaican and Welsh girl. And she goes through Bristol, Devon, Cardiff, Kingston, and so forth. And throughout all of this, and similar in Sadia Hartman also uses the sort of third person as a way to create some distance between herself and the characters that she's vivifying and enlivening, but also as a, uh, it also provides an entry point to providing, to adding your own kind of commentary and analysis. So for me, I found that when I tried the third person, it opened up a lot of ex expressive possibilities for myself. I found myself able to write with much less inhibitions I was less concerned about have I taken the turn left? Have I gone an out of the station yet? Am I on the train yet? What's the time? Um, but I, most importantly, I think there were three things that made the third person really stick for me, which was like, first of all, there's enough distance for me 
to comment on this boy with some distance so that it wasn't so that I could I guess uh not just write a story that was going to be I guess mild and entertaining but I also wanted the piece to be edifying mm. um secondly I found that or someone mentioned to me that this sort of persona actually helped me to traverse a lot of different time periods. You find that the piece often shuttles between an accumulation of day to day. So there's past, present, uh, past, present, future kind of all blended in as well. So there's a, I'm shuttling between that accumulation of the daily as well as single and rup singular ruptural moments that take place on the bus or in my, own, in my own past. And lastly, I think that there was a split, sort of split sense of split there. So a sense of a split self that was taking place. Um, that created a kind of melancholy or disjunction, but also I think spoke to the ways in which I was differently estranged or or differently or belonged differently to different spaces and with different cohorts. And um, it was these three things that really, I guess, um, that I think gave me a lot of latitude to explore the sort of uh, affiliations, complicities, and I guess different feelings that were taking place um, in different spaces. And, and, and I am someone who tends to, be very driven by affect in my piece. I have to kind of think about what sort of feelings, what sort of register puts it certain parts of the be written in. And I guess lastly also, the reason why I think I ultimately couldn't do the sort of academic kind of style that I would have been comfortable with and sort of analyze some sort of critique was because I was also writing about subject matter that had has hardly ever been discussed um, within Australia or elsewhere. Like Bangsan is so unique in having a Lebanese and Vietnamese diaspora side by side and together. And I felt that if I didn't have some sort of artwork or work to kind of explore, to analyze, that I would have to create that myself. And so I felt that my piece was really an attempt to crystallize, I guess, silences or things that had been kind of, that are kind of present, but not really acknowledged, right? It's kind of swept up in a sort of multicultural umbrella with such a, um, you know, Ramadan night, Saigon place. Like, I just found myself having to do the work of creating that sort of record of, the space for myself in a way that I guess rubbed up against a lot of celebratory discourse and multiculturalism which I thought wasn't reflective of people's experiences within the space. Mm. We have a question from Julia who asks with beginning to come out of lockdown how have the speakers found reconnecting with other people in the places they haven't been able to visit? I can give a short answer here. Honestly, um, it's been great. I mean, I think for me, I've, I tend to talk a lot with friends anyway, so I've never really felt isolated, very fortunately enough. Um, I think in terms of reconnecting with places, it's been very exciting eating bumboe or going or um, buying food that I like, and but also very saddening as well to see the changes that have been taking place, whether that's, inf um, whether that's shops closing because of infrastructural developments like the Bangsan Metro here, or certain shops take deciding to um, have diff different training hours um, so I guess what I've been doing is just walking around taking note of the uh, stores that are here that are gone as well as the signage that's been put up like we have relocated or now we only open on certain days and um, yeah that's been my experience it's been nice to be back but also saddening to think that um, the space has had to weather a lot um, I'll just have a little reply as well and it was uh, just thinking on that my essay was a lot to do like though a, a lot about physical space um a lot of it was about the spaces between like within your relationship with people and the trust and care you give to each other and so it kind of, for me personally like I was been back to see my family um it was of course really wonderful but almost didn't feel as hugely momentous because through writing the essay and just honestly thinking on how much like there already is a substance of the connection it made it just seem like any good old day where at, like maybe no time has passed at all despite so much having had it happened because you return to those um um you return to having all of these people, you, all of the, your loved ones together and you fall back into so easily these like move, this movement of your bodies and just the way the conversation goes. 
Um, so yeah, I remember thinking it was a bit odd. It was really fun, but like I got to my parents, I hadn't seen them in four months. And then I took a six hour nap, like on the couch, like I didn't even, and I was like, this is fantastic. Like this is the good old days. So yeah, it was, it was great in that way for me. particularly. I think, um, yeah, time has been really weird. Like catching up with friends um, face to face has been, and realizing that it's been a good few months since you've actually seen them face to face. Um, but it also feels like no time has passed at all. And so it just feels this, yeah, like trying to, um, time feels really relative. <laughs> and I, um, yeah, I like the way that I move through the world now, I'm just like, huh like time feels like it's all happening at once um and how just thinking about how like everything is and the concept of time not just for us as humans but like for plants or for like um animals or um yeah like it just I don't know I think I'm going through another existential crisis but that yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I guess we'll probably have to start wrapping this up. Um, but just want to say a massive thank you to all three of you. Um, I think you were tasked um, with a really hard thing to do, which is to focus on care and isolation in a time where you're really with your thoughts and um, I'm sure it was therapeutic, but I'm sure it was very taxing as well. Um, but all three essays were excellent. Uh, for those of you listening, go to Sydney Review of Books and you can catch all of them there. Um, and I think that's it. Did any, did any of you guys need to say anything before we close off? Thanks for the great conversation, everyone. And thanks, Martin, for moderating and asking very thoughtful questions. It was really good to kind of have a, a different person that wasn't us or the editors or uh, no, no, someone that with the readers that we had with it. And kind of like being able to talk about the work after it's out in the world is pretty, it's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. And thanks again for like Adana and Katriana for like their stewardship and support throughout the entire process. Um, yeah, we couldn't have done it without them. So. Oh, wait, Helen and Annie have had this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I guess. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Sunday afternoon. Thank There's you. There's also one more boundless session afterwards as well. Yes. Uh, there is the When Breath Meets Air session happening at five o'clock. Um, and it's not too late to register. So go ahead and do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs>